Um, thanks for waiting. We have our main speaker, Ailey McAdam. Now, Ailey is a globally famous engineer and she works for Bechtel and she's the C their senior vice president and the president of their mining and metals global unit. And I'll let Ailey do her speaking for herself. She's had a fascinating career and she's headed up some of the world's most significant engineering projects, including the Boston Dig, Sydney Metro, Crossrail. So without further ado, I will hand you over to Ailey. Thank you so much for joining us, Ailey. Thank you, Helena. No, it's a, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure. And, and hello, everybody. Hello, everybody. Um, Helena, can you see my slides? Can you hear me? I can yes, hear you. we can see you. We can see your slides, Ailey. Thank you. Uh, that's great. That's great. Thank you. Um, so what I what I thought, thanks for the nice introduction. I have worked on some some great projects, but I don't really consider myself as a famous engineer, but uh, I've worked on some some great projects that uh, I hope have made a, a difference to the way people li live their lives. And it's been really fun working with the teams. And I, I just thought I'd spend a little bit of time talking about um, what an what an engineer um, from from my perspective, um, you know, different kinds of engineers, why I why I chose engineering as, as my profession and then go through a little bit of my my global experience on the projects I've been on and and, and the difference I think they've made um, and then leave plenty of time for, for questions and answers. So I, I hope that I hope that works with everybody. So, yeah, Ailey McAdam, I, I work for Bechtel. Um, Bechtel is a, an engineering procurement and construction project um, pr uh, contract. Pro um, company and we build projects. So we design, uh, we procure, and what that means is we 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 buy the equipment, we buy the pipe, we buy the concrete, uh, we buy the the um, uh, the pumps, the columns, etc., um, and construct. And that means we build, uh, and then we start the plant up, depending on on what the pro project is, and then we hand over to the customer, and then we go and build another project somewhere else in the world. Uh, and I've I've uh, worked with with Bechtel for 37 years, ever since I graduated as the as a chemical engineer. Uh, I've I've worked with Bechtel and I've worked with them in, in, in with our energy group, with our infrastructure group, and now I'm 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 very privileged to lead our mining and metals um, business, our global mining and metals business, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, towards the end of my talk. So, um, so what do I um, see as an engineer? So the the reason the reason I I picked engineering was was, was well, one I was was I was good at maths, physics, and chemistry, um, but you don't have to be good at all three of those. Um, but you know, I, I I liked building things. I liked thinking about things. I liked creating things. Um, and these are these are you know, when I think about engineering, you see the words on 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 this slide. It's architects, uh, the mastermind, the builder, designer, divisor, planner, creator. And if you look around the room um, or 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 think about the things you use every day, engineers have been all types of different engineers have been um, have been involved in in putting in 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 designing and fabricating and creating. Um, what what you see around you every day, and this on this slide, you can see the different types of engineering. Now, I happen to be a chemical engineer, um, but you have electrical, materials, biomedical, civil, marine, industrial, environmental, mechanical. So you have different types of engineers which specialise on a particular type um, of engineering, of, of 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 creation, of design, of 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 construction. And when I when I think about you know, what one of the main reasons I enjoy talking to audiences like this and, and you um, is to help is is when as you're creating choices and making choices of of what you want to do uh, for in your career and what you want to study. Um, I just like I want to give you insight into what engineering is all about, just so it's an input into your decision making. Um, I found often that um, people don't quite understand the value of engineering and what engineering is all about. And so I just want to um, help help with that um, decision making, just so you've got the information. Um, and then obviously then you make 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 your choice. And why engineering for me? Well, it is the opportunity to solve global problems. 
Um, now, the ones that I'm particularly focused on in, in mining and metals is electromobility, urbanisation, engineering transition and food security. So in mining um, us responsibly, so we've got to do it in a very sustainable way, um, but 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 providing copper, which is the lifeblood, literally the lifeblood of, of decarbonisation, and we can talk about it later if there's any questions on that. Um, nickel, lithium, um, which are important ingredients for batteries to support EV, EV vehicles, phosphate, potash, which are kind of fundamental inputs and nutrients for for growing um, for agriculture and, and increasing production in agriculture, um, iron ore um, and aluminium for to 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 help construct and build um, buildings and support the urbanisation drive. So um, so you you have for so for engineering is an opportunity to solve global problems. And you also can make an impact on the world and improve lives. So some of the projects I'll talk about, um, particularly around urban infrastructure, it's help connect communities so that communities can um, to, can travel from from A to B easier. Um, that drives the economic um, prosperity of the region. It helps people and it helps with jobs. But the more connected people are, the more they can support other communities. So there's more jobs, etc. So it does it makes makes an impact on the world. Um, and you can use your creative create create creativity every day. Um, uh, there's always there's it's an opportunity ri rich environment. Um, so there's always something um, that can improve, always something that we can work on and, and get better. And it's a good salary. There's always going to be a need for engineers, and if there's a need for a particular profession, then salaries um, salaries are maintained. So it's a, it's 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 good. It's it's a good salary. And as I'll um, as I'll talk about my career, there's opportunities to travel. Now you don't have to travel. Um, you know, if if you if you want to stay in one place, um, there'll be plenty of opportunities. But if you do want to travel, it's a it's a it's a great career to choose. And there's opportunities for rapid career advancement. And as I said, there's always a need for engineers um, and um, uh, and teams that that move around the world and and um, um, and develop supporting these projects. Um, it's a team sport. So um, so there's you know, for, for if for a successful project, you need engineers, and those engineers need to be um, collaborating and talking with cost people with um, legal, with lawyers, with um, um, with social, social, environmental, with environmentalists, with econo with um, economists, with customers, with the local community. So actually building building these these projects and, and actually pursuing a career in engineering, it's a it's it's not an individual thing. It, 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 you do get real technical experts who are who are subject matter experts and and they are fantastic and we couldn't do without them. But most engineers work in teams and um, and you get that that buzz of working with high performing teams. And with that um, comes career advancement. So I thought I'd talk a little bit now about um, about my global experience and what you can see on this map are um, projects um, that I've worked on all around the world and um, um, and I'll talk about where I've lived. So I've I've moved probably two or three times. I should have said I um I have two children, and both of my children were born in the states uh, when I was working on the Boston Central Artery project. My husband and I moved there. Um, uh, two children. I have a 22 year old uh, boy and a 25 year old girl. Um, uh, they they're in the UK. Um, just finishing university and my husband, my husband travels with me um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that where where we're located at the moment. At the moment, actually, I'm in a hotel room in Pittsburgh, <laughs> which is why um, it's, you see my slightly weird background, but uh, that's where I am at the moment. So um, I started, uh, so as I say, I started off as a chemical engineer. Um, I joined Bechtel in our energy division. And I was working um, on a, an environmental um, cleanup project in Baghdad, and I actually relocated there for nine months. So when I was 20, probably 28, 29, something like that, so it's pretty early on in my career, 
um, I was asked to, if I'd like to have an assignment in Baghdad and I was looking for, you know, I'm always keen to, to grab an opportunity. So I said yes. And my husband now, but uh, boyfriend at the time was supportive of that. So he, um, he said, yeah, go and go and do your thing. See you when you get back. Um, so I, I, I worked in Baghdad for nine months. And the reason um, one of the, 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 the reasons that they particularly wanted me on the team was it was just after the Iran-Iraq war. Um, and so there was a, unfortunately, tragically, a lot of men were killed in that Iran-Iraq war and um, a lot of the engineers, but there's a lot to do to rebuild the country. And a lot of those engineers were women um, and but hadn't been trained. And the, the culture in, in Baghdad was that it's more e it's easier for a, um, a foreign woman to teach um, um, the, the girls and the women there than than a foreign man. Um, so I went pretty, pretty early on in my career and um, and had a fantastic time in Baghdad, um, all sorts of different experiences, which I can I can talk about later if there are any questions. But that was a kind of a, a formative part of my of my career. Um, um, I, it was tough. I was the only woman in with with a team of 40 men, um, made such great relationships. I, I understood my own resiliency. Um, I understand, you know, if, if I could get through that, I could get through anything. Um, so it was, it was, um, you know, kind of an important, important part of of my career, and I look back on it really fondly. I then went to Holland. This was a much small. This was much a shorter duration, only for about two or three months. Uh, by that time, I my I think it's really important. As you probably heard from the, my, the beginning of my comments, purpose and working on something purpose for purpose is something that. Um, I learned really on early on in my career is what motivated me, what wanted me, why I wanted to jump out of bed. Um, and um, at that time, the purpose that that was driving was environmental, um, was was water clean up, air clean up, um, um, waste clean up. And I worked on a um, a paint recycling project in Holland. So there were um, it was a paint factory with lots of uh, cans of paint, and and what we were doing was working on a a way that we could recycle, clean clean the cans, recycle, and use the use the cans. And that was just for a couple of months. But it was I just went there for a couple of months and working with the team, and it was uh, you know it was a, it was a really good experience. And then, um, then I spent probably about eight or nine months in in Romania. Um, now this was just after the revolution, so it was just after Ceausescu was 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 overthrown. And um, it's probably eighty eight. No, sorry, not eighty eight. Yeah, yeah, round about that. Eight, maybe eighty nine, early early nineties. And. Um, um, Romania was was applying to the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development, that's the EBRD, for funding um, to, to start rebuilding their country or invest in their country. And EBRD at the time had a, and still do, they had a requirement that you have to do an environmental impact assessment to kind of set your baseline on in a, in a town or in a country before you can apply for funding to, to build projects that will improve people's livelihood. Um, what EBRD were focused on is that any money they were lending into a country, they wanted to see an environmental improvement as a consequence. So I actually worked, I with a team of Romania engineers, um, worked with for the EBRD to set uh, an environmental baseline. So I travelled, I uh, spent about seven or eight months in the back of a pickup truck um, um, uh, traveling around Romania. Um, one of the outcomes of that, as you can see, is you know, years later, um, is EBRD funded um, urban infrastructure, uh, transport um, to help people travel from A to B in a in a sustainable way. So it's 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 good to see when you see a picture like this. It's good to see the outcome of of your efforts that were years before. Um, and these are some of the fantastic um, women, the men and women, but these are some of the fantastic women I've worked with. I'm, I've kind of sprinkled in some pictures of people um, in, in, the pit, in, in with the pictures of the project that I'm going through, because projects are people. And then uh, I, 
I worked still in the environmental side of things, worked with up on at BP Grangemouth, which is an effluent treatment plant uh, on their effluent treatment plant. So it's a it's an oil refinery up in Scotland. Um, actually, just seeing in the news, it's a, an oil refinery, one of the first ones that is committing to go get, get to net zero by by 20, I think it's 2040, um, which is a real credit to them. And they've, they've got a they've got a real a real plan to get to net zero by by 2040, which is great to see. Um, but the, the part of the work that I was uh, the part of the project I was working on was a was a, a water treatment plant. And I was working for the first time Well, no, actually the second time I had when I was a, a student, I worked with bugs in sewage water treatment plants. But this is the second time I worked with bugs on anaerobic and aerobic digestion. So these bugs would would eat away at the oil and break down the oil um, in a way that we could separate it from water. It was you know, it was fascinating um, in these big thickeners and tanks and digesters. Um, very successful project and we managed to improve the effluent coming out of that plant considerably. Um, and then actually my, it was my husband's job that took him over to, by that time I was married, um, that took my husband's job over to the States. And um, of course I wanted to join him there. And the energy group that I'd been working on previously within Bechtel didn't have any projects in Boston, but our infrastructure group did. So I transferred from our um, energy um, division to our infrastructure vision and I started doing commercial management because I couldn't do any civil engineering because I wasn't I was a chemical engineer so um, I did co contract management um, I I'm, and I sort of transferred into the commercial management and project management of our business but there are lessons learned there with a company like Bechtel you can transfer from division to, to division and bits of the world to bits of the world because the way we do things, the way we manage health and safety and quality and cost and schedule and construction is very similar. Um, and the tools we use and the processes we use are very similar in all parts of the company. So you can take what you learned in one part of the company and take it to another part. And I found that out to my benefit in, in Boston. So this is one I don't know if you've been to anybody's been to Boston, but so like we moved there in 1995 and at that time there was this huge great big green elevated artery um steel huge great big steel um it's a monstrosity really seven lanes wide that was cutting off boston from the coast and it was always getting blocked and there were always a whole load of accidents um so what we were doing was do our work was to was to build tunnels underneath Boston and and and, uh, and bridges over the over the river, connecting with the airport. And we could we then the let the end result was demolishing this green steel structure that was basically, as I said, cutting off Boston from 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 the coast. Um, and we had to do that. It was like it was like um, sort of threading the uh, a thread the thread through the eye of the needle because we had to keep the city running so when we were doing all this construction and building roads and tunnels and bridges we had to keep the city running it was no good just closing down the city building building the um, infrastructure and then opening up the city again so it was it was like someone someone very aptly described it it was like performing heart surgery on 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 a, a runner who was running a marathon while they were running a marathon it was um it was really intricate had to be really really well planned um and then i moved back to the uk so we we spent seven years in boston on the on the central artery tunnel project that's where both our kids were born and then i moved back to the uk to work on high speed one and my particular role was to lead the refurbishment and redevelopment of St Pancras Station. If you've been to London, it's the it's the station that's at the end of the um, high speed one line. It's a beautiful 125 year old station. There we renovate, as I said, it was 100, 100, 120 years old. Victorians built it. They were fantastic constructors. And we, we renovated it um, from a what was a really old crumbling decrepit dark building um, into what you see today, which is, um, you know, is, is an iconic um, um, station um, in London, which supports the Eurostar. Um, by the end of the project, I was actually um, project director of the whole project. So we, we refurbished, refurbished and rebuilt St Pancras Station with a fantastic team of people uh, and contractors. And I was um, 
um, responsible for actually opening up the service, the Eurostar, into St Pancras Station. And in that role, uh, was invited to meet the Queen when the Queen came to open up St Pancras Station in 2003, November 2000, no, 2007, November 2007 which was a, 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 it's a highlight of my career. I didn't think it was going to be a highlight, but after I met her, it was a highlight in my career and may she, may she rest in peace. She's a fantastic woman. And these are some of the, some other fantastic women um, that uh, I worked with on, on the, that project. These are, these are a Bettel, my Bettel and Bettel colleagues of mine. And then I moved on to Crossrail. Um, I, I was the, on the on that project, the project director of Bet Bettel was the big delivery partner for, for, for Crossrail. And for the first three years in the tunneling phase, I was the, the project director. This is a TBM, a tunnel boring machine. Um, this is what is like a worm that goes under London that, that churns away um, and, and basically constructs tunnels um, underneath London. And you can imagine what's underneath there, the hundreds of years of construction and um, and, and life that's been in London, there's a there's a lot of underground shoot, um, underground tunnels and post office tunnels and uh, water pipe, huge great big water pipes and gas pipes and um, secret tunnels for war, um, for, for where people can uh, be protected from the war. It's uh, and bomb 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 um, shelters. It's uh, there's a lot down there underneath the ground, and what we had to do was thread um, thread the needle of a couple of tunnels from east to west London. It was again, it was um, you know fantastic work. I'll talk a little bit more about tunnel boring machines um, later. Um, this is the the inside of a tunnel boring machine. Um, they're like mini factories themselves, um, and as I say, I I could answer answer any questions. And this is if you if I don't know if anyone's um, visited the Elizabeth lines crossrail was was called crossrail and that then it was renamed the Elizabeth line um, and you can see you can see um, um, the 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 finished work um, which is which is I'm very 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 proud of we also um, I'm, we were also uh, involved in the redevelopment of crossrail and Reading station which some of you actually when you travel from where you are in Torbay up to up to London probably pass through Reading. Um, some more, some more of the fantastic women in the team, um, and this is what Cross Crossroad and Reading looks like now. I'll speed up a little bit to make sure there's time for questions. Um, then I moved over to my husband and I moved over to Sydney. By this time, our kids were were um, in university or just finishing school and in university, so. Um, we we moved over to to Sydney and um, to start up our infrastructure Bettel's infrastructure business uh, in Australia, and one of the first jobs we won was um, was in on the Sydney Metro, and these are this just gives you a little bit of an indication of of the kind of the mini factories. One of these things would have cost about ten million ten million pounds something like that, um, and what they do is they 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 churn away at the at the earth as you're going under. These ones actually went under Sydney Harbour, which is the only the second tunnel to be built under Sydney Harbour and the first one to be done by a tunnel boring machine. Um, so they churn away at the earth and they push the earth back on long conveyors and then you, we push concrete segments in place of the void that had been created by churning away the earth. You put co concrete segments in and then you thrust at the back and push the tunnel boring machine in and then you make advance of about, you know, a meter, meter and a half at a time, and then you do the same thing. It's like it, so you do the same thing time and time again, um, and slowly building the tunnel behind you. And uh, this is what the, the Sydney Metro. This is obviously not the underground section. This is a viaduct. So the, the Sydney, 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 um, the local government is investing a significant amount to to um, um, improve the transportation in Sydney. And then uh, we we um, we were privileged enough to be chosen to be the development partner for Western Sydney Airport in Australia. Um, so this is a brand new Greenfields Airport, one of the few in the world actually that have been built great Greenfield. Um, uh, and that's going to be opened in 2026. And these are some of the women that I've worked with. And now this now takes me to Chile. So so then I, I moved from our infrastructure um, in leading big parts of our infrastructure business to our mining and metals business. And when when the company asked me to to lead our mining and metals business, I thought, 
I don't know anything about the mining and metals business, um, but the fact I'm a chemical engineer and understand process and how to how really to think about turning a raw product into into a you know, raw material into a product that together with all my big infrastructure experience, um, you know, big infrastructure projects, working with the communities, with the supply chain, big teams, thousands of people in the teams, lots of supply chain, lots of contracts, lots of suppliers. Those two things together, um, I think, stand me in in in, in pretty good stead um, to to lead the mining and metals business, and it's, it's actually proving to be very successful. Now, this is um this is a, a let me give you another one. I think the next picture gives you gives you a bit better. So this is a copper concentrator. This is at four thousand three hundred meters in the Andes in Chile, um, and it's it's I've been up there a couple of times, and it's difficult to breathe up there. Never mind think. Um, and we've worked uh, last year, we worked 35 million hours. So we had 15,000 workers up there in diff in two shifts, so 15,000 at one time um, without any lost time accidents. So the health and safety record was fantastic, um, something I'm, pr I'm very proud of. And to do that at 4,300 feet um, when it's difficult to think, never mind work safely, um, is 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 uh, is a real credit to the team. The, and this this is a, on MLP Inco. This is um, another um, copper concentrator in 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 Chile. Um, one of the in, one, what's becoming increasingly important is the ESG is is how we take care of ESG issues and challenges when we're supporting our customers and building copper concentrators. What a copper concentrator is? It takes the ore and the earth out of the ground, the rock out of the ground, crushes it, and separates the copper from the rock. Um, and the process of the copper to 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 do what what uh, what we do with it in for for uh, to support decarbonisation and energy transition. <clears throat> and one of the things, one of the ESG side of things, we obviously need to make sure we have use as much pa less power as we can, but also as le less water as we can, and not disrupt the aquifers that are up in the mountains. So what we've done is actually pipe water from the ocean, we've put it through desalination plants and then pipe it up the mountain or pump it up the mountain through pipe through pipe to the concentrator, which is up, as I said before, is up at 4000 metres, which is really high. Um, and so the pipeline you see here, I thought it might be quite interesting for you, is that pipeline you see here going through the mountains um, is the one that we constructed. And as you can, it's pretty, pretty, um, um, you know, it's it's challenging work because you obviously want to cut into the mountain as less as as as, as less as you can or as least as you can you want to make as much as little impact on the mountain as you can but you need to have the equipment and the people and the and the and the um and the welding equipment and the installation equipment you've got to leave enough space for that and you're on the side of a mountain so the 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 health and safety considerations are um are yeah, really, really important. I'm very proud to say we've just pressure tested, which means it will hold the pressure um, of the water required to be pumped up the hill um, uh, successfully. Um, so that 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 installation has just been completed um, with no significant health and safety issues, which is which is great. So everybody went home safe every day. It took us a couple of years and we were building it through COVID. But everyone went safe home safe every day. And this is just another another view. It's a bit difficult to see. Actually, this is all the equipment on the side of the mountain. It's like a conveyor belt um, um, process. And this is a, a picture of the desalination plant, which takes salt water, takes the the, the minerals and the and the and the salt out of the seawater. Makes I won't say it's fresh water, but it's 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 water that's um, that is a, a specification that is okay to um, be part of the copper process. And that means it doesn't impact the aquifers, the freshwater aquifers that are up in the mountains. And that's my last slide. So I went through pretty quickly, but what I wanted to do was was leave enough uh, enough time for for questions and answers. Um, so this is with with me with um, with some of the the fantastic team. This is actually Crossrail. Um, so on the Elizabeth Line. So these are this is some of the team that helped construct the Elizabeth Line. <laughs> 